Good morning, church. I'm so glad you're here. Why don't you stay to your feet? We're going to sing together, turn our hearts to the Lord. Let's bless his name together. You make it easy to love you. You are good and you are kind. You bring joy into my life. You make it easy to trust you. have never left my side. You've been faithful every time. And all I want is you. fear for you are by my side I'll follow you Springs Baptist Church and I'm just so thankful to be a part of what he's doing last Sunday Easter Sunday 
as we celebrated resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God did incredible things here. First of all, he brought all kinds of people in huge numbers to our campus. We had over 2,500 people in attendance on Easter Sunday. We praise the Lord for that. But even better than that, we saw people trust Jesus Christ as Savior throughout our services over Easter weekend. And so we just praise the Lord for that. Can we give God praise and glory for what he's doing? in this place. It's just good to see him at work, and I'm so thankful for what he's doing. I'm excited about what's going to be happening next Sunday, beginning next Sunday, and going all the way through next Wednesday night. We're having something called Revive, and that's a spring revival meeting where we're seeking God and seeking to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. I wanna take just a moment just to share with you some of the speakers who are gonna be with us and then also the musical guest who'll be leading us in worship. And listen, I wanna encourage you, pray for these speakers and pray for these worship leaders and then invite people to come because I promise you there's gonna be an incredible time every service and opportunities for people to come to know Jesus as Savior. Pray, invite, and then attend. Don't miss one of these services. Here's who's gonna be coming with us next week. Next Sunday morning, for all of our Sunday AM services, Shane Pruitt is gonna be our guest speaker. Shane works with the North American Mission Board as Next Generation Director, and God is using him to speak to literally hundreds of thousands of college students, high school students, middle school students, and others every year. And many people are coming to know Jesus Christ through Shane's ministry. He's no stranger to us here at Quail Springs. He'll be with us in the morning service. Then in the evening service, I'm really excited about this. Dr. Jeff DiGiacomo is gonna be back with us. He, of course, served for such a long time here on our staff. Now he serves as the pastor of uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Shawnee. He'll be preaching for us on Sunday night. Patrick Mayberry will be our worship leader, so you don't want to miss Sunday night. On Monday, our guest speaker that night is going to be Nathan Leno, who's the pastor of First Baptist Church, Forney, Texas. He comes from South Africa, an incredible speaker. You don't want to miss him. Our worship leaders will be Legacy 5. And then on Tuesday night, our, our worship leader will be worship leaders will be the Bowler Jacks. I'm going to be preaching on Tuesday night. Our staff asked, Pastor, will you come and preach one night of the revival? And so I'm going to be bringing a message called, Will Your Faith Save You? It's a great opportunity to invite someone who needs to hear the gospel to be here. Will your faith save you? And then on Wednesday night, America's Minister of Encouragement, Dennis Swanberg, will be our guest speaker. And uh, Charles Billingsley will be leading in worship. So be in prayer for what's going to be happening next week here at Quell Springs. And then I'm so excited about what's going to happen this morning. Our guest speaker today is Senator James Lankford. Uh, Senator Lankford was elected to the U.S. Senate in 2014. Before that, he served in the U.S. House of Representatives. Before his service in Congress, James served students and families for more than 20 years in ministry, including 15 years as director of student ministry for the Baptist Convention of Oklahoma and director of Falls Creek Youth Camp. James and his wife, Cindy, live here in Oklahoma City. They've been married more than 31 years. They have two daughters, Hannah and Jordan. And they've been members here at Quell Springs since 2008. Church family, will you make James Langford welcome and just express your thanksgiving that he's in this place today. Listen. One of, the things, one of the things I love about James Langford is when he comes to preach, he comes to preach. And uh, I've had him in to preach every year that I've been pastor here at Quell Springs. And I've always been blessed. Usually, in fact, every time until today, I've been away when he's come to preach. And we've just watched and listened uh, on the online service and just been blessed by the way he opens the Word of God and teaches us. And so I know God has a special word for us today. Right now, will you join with me as we pray together? Father in heaven, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this good day that you've given us. And Lord, we pray for what's going to happen today and God in the days to come. 
Lord, we ask that during our revived services, your Holy Spirit would come down and anoint each service. Lord, we pray for the speakers and the worship leaders. God, give them the words that we need to hear. And Lord, speak to our hearts. And Lord, we pray for men and women and young people and boys and girls to come to know Jesus as Savior through these revived meetings. Then Father, I pray for Senator James Langford. Lord, I thank you for him and for Cindy. Thank you, God, for the way you are using them in our state, our nation, and all over the world. And God, we pray that this morning you would speak a word to our hearts as James comes to open the word of God to us. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. And church, if you agree, will you say amen? Amen, if you will. We're going to continue to worship. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Would you all stand to your feet? Scripture tells us that right now there's a song in heaven surrounding the throne of Jesus that says, you are holy and set apart. Let's join in with that song and bless his name together. Say, God, you're holy. Would you move in our lives, move in our hearts today?
sound semi-awake on it. You're going to have to help me today a little bit. I just returned from Israel, and I am eight hours ahead of where I am right now. So I'm going to just assume this. If any of you fall asleep during my sermon, you're catching my jet lag, okay? So I'm just going to assume that that's a contagious uh, piece on it. I just want to make this quick comment on it. Being in Israel for the past week, it's a nation that is at war. It's a region that it's at war. We are we are commanded in scripture to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but they're facing a lot. Uh, I spent time in the past week along what they call the Gaza envelope, that area right around the Gaza Strip, meeting with some of the folks in the kibbutz and was at the Nova uh, festival site, talking to some of the families of hostages that literally every single day they're getting up knowing that they've got loved ones uh, that are being held hostage. Uh, I spent time along the Syria Lebanon border where there's been 4,000 rockets that have been fired into northern Israel uh, in the past several months. Uh, it, is, it is a difficult season for there and is getting more so. So as we pray for the safety and peace of that entire region, for every civilian, for every individual, we also pray for peace in there in a unique way. So as you're praying and you're lifting things up for a family, as a family, that'd be an encouragement that I would have for you as well uh, to be able to join us in that. We're going to spend this morning and start this morning, but we're going to do a bit of Bible drill today, as you and I have done before, uh, to be able to walk through multiple passages. But on just a typical Sunday morning like it is, I'm going to start in the book of Leviticus, because that's where we like to start, is in the book of Leviticus, right? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, when was the last time you read through Leviticus? So let me just go ahead and give you just a summary, a little bit of it. Le Leviticus is that time period that the uh, Hebrews have left out from captivity in Egypt. They're now wandering in the desert and God is teaching them how to be a wholly separate, different people than what they were before. They used to be slaves in Egypt and lived in a pagan culture and had to be able to participate in that culture as slaves. And God has pulled them out into the wilderness and said, I'm going to reteach you during this time period. And they spend a lot of time going through the specific dimensions and type of material and everything on every table, lampstand, every part of the tabernacle that they're traveling around in, all of those things. And at some point you're reading through Leviticus and you're going, how long is this book? Okay. And going through the details. And you're reading through all the intricacies of it, but it's really focused in on you're a wholly separate people. 
and I want to show you what it looks like to be holy and separate because it's different than the culture before. I know the culture that you were in, you're not in that culture anymore. And I'm going to pull you out of that culture and have you stand out in culture as something different because I want people to know me based on seeing you and what is different in you. So it walks through all these details and then it gets to Leviticus 19. Now Leviticus 19 is a chapter that looks like it was like Moses and God were saying, okay, I got a couple of things I got to run through real fast. And so there's just this long list of things that he runs through in Leviticus 19 uh, to be able to say, here are just some things to, to put out there. Things, obvious things like don't lie, don't steal, keep the law of God. But he also throws in a, a statement, don't, don't go to a fortune teller or try to communicate with the dead. Uh, if you reap a harvest, leave the edges of your field un, unreaped so the poor could go through and could gather that. One of my favorites in Leviticus 19 is don't eat meat when it's three days old. Not a bad idea for people that don't have refrigerators. I've got to just tell you, that's not only a law of God, that's a pretty good idea, okay? Uh, it, it goes through different things like uh, one that says, pay people on time. If you've hired somebody, pay them on time. Don't hold back their wages. That's in Leviticus 19. Don't wear clothes made of two types of material, okay? Uh, don't plant two types of seed. One of my personal favorites in it, don't curse a deaf man or put a stumbling block in front of a blind man. In other words, don't be that guy, okay? Don't be a jerk, okay? It's pretty straightforward in it. Stand and rise in the presence of the aged. That's in Leviticus 19. Use standard weights and measures. Don't cheat people because your measurements are a little bit off and you're just cheating people. That's in Leviticus. So again, you get the feel of it. It's just like boom, 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 boom. It goes through all these different things. They're just listing out as things in Leviticus 19. And then he bumps into Leviticus 19:18 where it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself, because I am the Lord. Now that's all of a sudden we're like, oh, I know that passage. That's actually the only place that phrase is recorded in all of the Old Testament. It's right there in the middle of Leviticus and a long list of other items is this one little statement Love your neighbor as yourself because I am the Lord. It's such a common statement now, we forget where it originated from. Apparently Jesus was somebody who studied Leviticus as well because he pulls that statement. Mark chapter 12 is a passage and we're gonna blitz through a bunch of different passages in the New Testament. A religious leader, it, it says actually an attorney, uh, no, no no offense on attorneys here. No attorney, don't, don't insert attorney joke here, okay? Well, it says one of the teachers of the law, an attorney came to him and came to him debating. N noticing that Jesus had given him a good answer, he asked him of all the commandments, which is the most important? In other words, what's the big one? Now, this is an actually pretty pragmatic question. If you know your Jewish history and your teachings, we as Gentiles see 10 commandments. You ask anyone, how many commandments are you? They'll say 10 the next funny statement is, can you list them? And they're like, yeah, it's too many to list, okay? For a Jewish believer, they see 613 commands in the Torah, not 10. In fact, if you walk past a Jewish believer that wears the tassels down on the side, those tassels have 613 turns on them, one for each of the commandments. So this is a pretty pragmatic question this attorney's coming in to be able to ask. He's saying, Okay, there's, there's 613 commandments. Which one's the big one? Okay, which is the one I want to make sure I don't miss in case I miss one of the 613? The literal translation of it is, which is the heaviest of all the commandments? Which one is that? And he comes back to him and he says, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, with your mind, and your strength. But then Jesus goes on and says, the second is like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. No one would have been surprised when Jesus, by the way, starts by saying, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is what's called the Shema in, in Jewish teachings. That is the most commonly repeated statement from Deuteronomy 6. No one would have been surprised, but I'm sure there would have been some folks a little bit curious 
when he said the second is like it and pulls this statement from Leviticus 19 and says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the big two. It's not the greatest com- suggestion. It's the greatest commandments. It's the two he says, no matter who you are, no matter what your title is, no matter what your background is, no matter how much you volunteer, no matter how much you engage, there's two things I want to make sure you don't miss. Learning to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. Now we know from the New Testament, how many New Testament writers pick up the teachings of Jesus on this. Paul in Galatians chapter five, he writes in Galatians 5, 14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. James writes in James chapter two, if you really keep the royal law, I love that term that he uses. We know about the golden rule. This is the one he says, this is the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Again, Paul comes back, Romans 13. He says, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be, it's like, and there's a bunch of others. He said, they're all summed up in this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. If Jesus called these the two big commandments, it's probably not a bad idea that we come back and review them every once in a while. And to just say, how are we doing with these? Are we living these out? The most basic principle of learning to be able to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to be able to love your neighbor as yourself. So let me, let me just run through a couple of things. Is that all right? Let me just run through a couple of things on this. Uh, let me begin first on the Mount of Beatitudes. If you've got your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter five. This is that famous Sermon on the Mount. And it's interesting for me right now because just returning from Israel, when we were in the southern part of Israel or on the Gaza envelope and then driving back, we're heading into the Golan Heights in the far northern section of next to Syria. And when you're heading that way towards Golan, you've got to pass literally right past Capernaum, right past it. And you drive literally right past the Mount of Beatitudes. And it just reminds you again, if any of you have ever been to Israel and have seen the Mount of Beatitudes, it's remarkable to see it because we think about this, Jesus speaking to 5,000 plus people, no microphone, just speaking to 5,000 people, say, how did that work at that time until you get the Mount of Beatitudes just right next to Capernaum where it was where it actually occurred and you see it, it's like a perfect amphitheater with the water, the Sea of Galilee at the bottom and the mountain just comes up and curves like an amphitheater, much like this right here. And you think, yeah, I can see 5,000 people right here. I can see exactly how that would physically work to be able to do that. Plus Jesus invented teenagers, so he knew how to talk to teenagers with his outside voice. So he's probably pretty good at that as well. So he's there in this amphitheater setting and he says he sits down like a Jewish rabbi would do. We stand to teach, they sit to teach and he begins teaching them. And early on in the teaching, it's this very interesting statement he makes about culture. In Matthew chapter five, verse 43, he says this, you've heard that it was said. In other words, people say this, this is what you teach your kids. This is what culture says. This is the common statement among culture. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Pause, quick review. Is that what Leviticus 19 says? Leviticus 19 just says, love your neighbor. But by the time it gets from Leviticus 19, fast forward over a thousand years to be able to get to this time of Jesus, culture now says, oh yeah, yeah, Leviticus 19 is good stuff. Love your neighbor. But we love our neighbor and we hate our enemy. Now that is a saying I could live out with. Everybody good with that? That's one that'd be more fun to do. Love your neighbor, pick who I want to love, hate who I want to hate. And then pretend that that's actually a godly thing to be able to do. Jesus is saying, I know this is the common teaching, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Do not even the tax collectors do that? And if you greet only your own people, What are you doing different than others? Don't even the pagans do that? 
Everybody loves who they want to love and hates who they want to hate. But Jesus is saying, that's not what my followers are going to do. My followers aren't going to live that way. Fortunately, in my Bible, I don't know what, what translation you use. In my Bible, there's a footnote here that's a really important footnote on this passage about love your neighbor, hate your enemy. My, my footnote reads at the bottom of the page, this verse does not apply when you're in politics. <laughs> it's, a, it's a helpful footnote. It doesn't apply when you're in politics, talking about politicians, talking about the other party or people within your own party you disagree with. It does not apply when there's so slow service at a restaurant or in a store. It doesn't apply to foreigners, homeless people, or bad camel drivers in traffic. Super helpful footnote. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> yeah. We still live what Jesus was confronting when he said, culture, people around you say, love who you want to love and hate who you want to hate. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you'll be children of your father in heaven because he sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He puts the sun on everybody. So be like your father in heaven. So it, there's a couple obvious questions with this. First of all, why would we live this way? No, no one else lives this way. Why would we live this way? I have to tell you, your family, our community, and our nation would be different if people love their neighbor and love their enemy. We would be a different nation, we would be a different community. We're progressively growing more and more angry, more and more divided. We wake up every day to the news and the news basically begins every day with, if you think you were mad yesterday, just wait till today. And it's a constant stir. And it's really driving towards, you should love people that think like you and you should hate people that do not. And as we become more and more divided, here's Jesus in the middle of it saying, I, I know that's what culture says. I know that's what everybody says, but that's not what I say. Because if your family's gonna be different, if your community's gonna be different, love your neighbor, love your enemy. Just a little pullback a little bit, if I can do this. My parents divorced when I was four years old. Mom remarried when I was 12. And the man that she married um, was, was a bit of an angry man. He was an usher at church. So we went to church all the time. He was the greeter outside the door and he would always greet people and welcome people and would smile and talk to people and welcome them in. And he was always the happy person wearing the bright jackets and all that stuff when you came in. But every Sunday when we left, he would shred everybody and talk about everybody in the car on the way home. He was angry and he was bitter all the time. And it drove a bitter thing among our family because it was about loving who I want to love and hating who I want to hate, regardless of where you sit in church or what would happen. And that was my family when I was 12 and 13 years old. But I would say to you, if you're the person that at home, you want to just gripe and be bitter and angry and run people down, they may not be in your family, but your kids are watching you and they're picking up on that bitter, angry spirit. They're picking up on that attitude of those evil people, those whatever. And you have to decide, I know what culture says, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but what will it be in your family? What will it be in our community, in our church, in our nation? Because if things are going to be different, we have to engage in this different. We have to actually do things Jesus' way to be able to see what occurs. Because we love our enemies because we remember what Paul said in Colossians chapter one when he said, once you were alienated from God and you were an enemy in your mind because of your evil behavior. 
I was once an enemy of God and God loved and forgave me. And so I'm learning how to be able to love people that I disagree with as well. Now, by the way, none of us get this right, but we all know what happens when we don't. Paul reminds us of this in Galatians chapter five. I I read this passage, but let me read the rest of it to you. Paul in Galatians chapter five said, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But then he adds this sentence. If you bite and devour each other, watch out because you'll be destroyed by each other. Paul gives both sides of it and says the whole law summed up in this one command Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you don't do this, you're going to see angry, division, fighting, devouring. I see families that live that way. I see churches that live that way. I see communities in a nation that live that way. The warning is ancient, but the solution is still current. It is making a decision. I understand that's what culture says, but Jesus called us to something different. Now the cop-out question is, okay, if I'm gonna love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Let me shorten the list, got it? Not a new question on this. We all know this. Turn over your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. One of the most familiar stories. It says on one occasion, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law, again, another attorney, they build Jesus by every 15 minute segments, I'm sure as well. It says, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what's written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You're like, wow, nailed it. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself and so he asked Jesus, so who's my neighbor? Let me shorten the list. In reply, Jesus came back with a question. And it's kind of funny, I had a um, Jewish teacher that I was with this past week and we were interacting back and forth and he was asking a question, he said, Uh, He said, Gentiles always come to us and say, why do you ask questions all the time as Jews? Why are you constantly asking questions on everything? And he said, we always respond, why not? (laughs) I was like, you're funny, okay? So, but literally Jesus is doing that at this point. Uh, He comes back and he says, you asked me a question, let me come back to you with a story and a question as well. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and he went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man passed by on the other side. So too a Levite came to the place, saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, took pity on him, went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. It's, actually, it was grape juice, Never mind. It's a whole different issue. Um, so then he, then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus asked the man, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? It's a pretty obvious story. Who's my neighbor? The one that you cared for, regardless of who they are. That's who it is. What's really interesting to me is we sometimes take this passage and pull it out and to say, this is all about, you know, finding who your Samaritan is. Who is your Samaritan? And and that's fine. But really the issue is our heart, regardless of who we're interacting with, it's about us. And who do we consider our neighbor? Are we willing to be able to look at someone who thinks different, acts different, is different than us, who is literally the enemy and show the affection of God to them? That's really the issue. Because for anyone who's around this passage before, has been around scripture, knows that in a Jewish audience that Jesus was speaking to, as soon as he said, but a Samaritan, there would have been a gasp because they intensely hated the Samaritans, hated their religious practices because they wouldn't come to the temple, hated their background. Literally the the term they used was half-breeds. I mean, it was a terrible, 
vindictive attitude in that time period on those folks they called the Samaritans. So for that group, when he said, but a Samaritan came and then said, this person acted like this Jew was his neighbor, what are you going to do? Would have been a sharp response to him. Now, many of us know that passage, but the question is, how do we handle it personally? I, um, I get the joy of flying back and forth to Washington, D.C. all the time, uh, and I usually fly first class on Southwest Airlines. <laughs> it's my usual route. For any of you that know Southwest would know, there is no first class, okay? You just get on the bus, okay? It's a bus, find a seat, get on. So no problem with that. They get me there back and forth safely every time so far, okay? So back and forth all the time. But I'm, at one point, this was about two months ago, I'm getting on board this flight, it's full as they always are on it. It's great for them, not great for the passengers, but great for them. So we're getting on board, trying to find a spot for my luggage. I got to find a couple of rows back to be able to find a spot to be able to put my luggage in the overhead. And I go and sit down in the row and directly behind me are three liberal activists. And just trust me, they didn't have a business card, but I could tell, okay? <laughs> I'll let you just fill in the gaps. These were folks flying from Washington, D.C. that had been protesting something and then they were coming back home, okay? So they're sitting in the row right behind me. And as I'm sitting down, my biased mind's thinking, they're gonna kick my seat the whole way, okay? So I, I, I sit down, I open my laptop, I start doing work the whole way home on it. At the end of the flight, I'm thinking, okay, my luggage is a couple of rows back. I'm gonna have to wait this out until everybody passes to grab my luggage. I stand up and turn around, and one of those folks that's sitting right behind me had, pulled, had seen me put my luggage up, had worked its way up and pulled it, and as I stood up, handed it to me and said, here you go, sir. I think this was yours you had to put behind us. And I smiled at her and I said, thank you. And in the back of my mind, I said, I just got served by a Samaritan. I just got a reminder to me to love by someone who chose to love me. Because it's pretty likely she disagrees with me on some things. And it's pretty likely I disagree with her on some things, but she chose to love me anyway. What a terrific example. And what a reminder to me it was at that moment. I have legitimate friends in Washington DC that serve on the other side of the aisle. They're good human beings, they just vote wrong all the time, <laughs> all the time. My task is not to destroy my enemy or declare that enemy. It's to love that person because I have been an enemy of God in the past and he loved me. And he said, I know what culture says. I'm keenly aware. Culture says, love who you want to love and hate who you want to hate. But I say, love your neighbor. Pray for those who persecute you. And it wasn't the greatest suggestion. It was the greatest commandment. And we've got to figure out what we're going to do with that. Can I go back to where I began? Mark chapter 12. I want to finish a part of a story there that I didn't finish all of it. And I want to make sure I finish this. Mark chapter 12, again, one of the teachers of the law comes to him and he heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given a good answer. He asked him of all the commandments, which is the heaviest, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. And then I love this, this attorney says to him, well said teacher, you're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, understanding, strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. By the way, if God ever speaks to you, you never have to say well said, okay? <laughs> or say you're right in saying, okay? He's always well said and he's always right, okay? Always. But it's interesting, this guy, when Jesus says to him, here's what's the truth, the guy responds back with, yeah, that's right. I think that's correct. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving your neighbor as yourself, those are the two big ones. Jesus, this is the interesting thing, he says, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to the man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. 
That's a fascinating statement. If I say to you, you're not far from Edmund, are you in Edmund or are you outside of Edmund? Outside, four people know that. Okay, let me help you with some English things. (laughs) If I say you're in Oklahoma or outside of Oklahoma, if you're outside of Oklahoma, are you in it? No, no, you're outside it. So for Jesus to be able to say to this guy, you are not far from the kingdom, what he's saying to this guy is like a gentle little nudge to say, you intellectually understand these things are good ideas. You intellectually understand loving God is important and loving people is essential. But you're not in the kingdom. You just get it here. Jesus nudges him and says, you're not far from the kingdom. Meaning, why don't you step in it? Because you're outside it. It is an absolutely beautiful Sunday morning. It is gorgeous outside today. You chose to be in church here this morning. So obviously you have an interest in God, in the teachings of God. But it's pretty likely there are some folks that are here that you intellectually agree that it would be a good thing if our culture loved God and loved people. That our nation would be different if we weren't so divided based on our anger, we were divided on issues because we don't all agree. And there are some folks that are wrong. But the way I speak about them and talk about them, the way I engage in conversation with them will demonstrate the love of God to them or not. And intellectually, you may say, that's a good idea. But in your heart, you know, you're not actually in the kingdom of God. You're a person who's respectful of the things of Jesus but you know in your gut, you don't know him. Because this religion, as people call it, as we term it often as a relationship, is really more than a relationship with God. It is a covenant with the eternal God. A commitment that lasts forever. Where we come to him and say, God, I have thoroughly messed up my life. (laughs) I have done some things that are really dumb. I've destroyed my family, my life. I've disqualified myself from some future based on the things that I've done. I cannot forgive myself. Would you forgive me, God? That covenant relationship begins with the God of the universe saying, you were once my enemy. You were once waging war against God by either ignoring him or aggressively pushing back saying, God, I don't care what you say, I'm not gonna do it. But now you hear the offer of Jesus saying, come, you're outside the kingdom. Why don't you come inside? It's a great offer. The question is, will you take it? To move from intellectually knowing this is a good idea to actually knowing the God who loves you and forgive you. Why don't you bow your heads for a moment? Let me give you some time just to be able to think and reflect on this. There's two issues really here. If you're a follower of Jesus, can I ask you to do something bold? Would you say to God, God, how am I doing loving everybody? Even people I disagree with, even people that are, that are wrong, even people that are legitimately immoral, And contrary to the teachings of God, God, do I love them like you love them? And spend some time with God on that. But for anyone that's here, that you know you're outside the kingdom. Again, obviously you're respectful of the things of God, you're here. But you know in your gut, you're outside the kingdom of God. You've never received the forgiveness of God. You've never started that covenant relationship, that commitment, that lifelong, eternal connection with God because you've never gone to him and admitted you're a sinner and I need to be forgiven. I'm gonna ask you to do something really bold that you know in your gut you need to do, but I'm gonna challenge you to actually move from knowing you need to, to doing it. And that is 
to pray right now and ask Jesus to forgive your sin and to take control of your life. Are you ready to do that? If you know you need to know Jesus, would you pray quietly right there where you are? You can just whisper this prayer to God. I guarantee you, God can hear your heart. Just to pray, Jesus, I am so sorry. Would you come into my life and take control? Would you forgive my sin? Give me a brand new start. Teach me how it is to be able to love you and to love other people, to see people as you do and to walk in your forgiveness. Father, I pray that you would use this time to rejuvenate our families and our attitudes and our hearts. Realign us from what culture says to what you say. We are, we're bad at this, God. You set the example for us and we have a tough time following it. So God, would you help us and teach us again how to be able to love everyone as you love us. Forgive and to help people know you. Guide us in that, Father, for the sake of our families, our community and our nation, reset us in a way that only you can. In the name of Jesus, I ask, amen. Hey, I've got a really simple invitation. If you're a person that really needs to process this more, and you know it, everybody's gonna be singing in just a moment, but you need more time to process it, thinking, God, I'm having a really hard time with this. There may be very likely somebody in your head that you're thinking, yeah, God, I'm gonna love all of those people, but that person doesn't deserve my love. And maybe you need to get your time with a friend or your spouse or your kids and to be able to break away on these steps and pray. Or maybe when I tell the story about my stepfather growing up, you know in your gut, that's probably what your family says about you. Because you know when you walk out of this building, you're setting the bitter, angry tone in your family and it's pulling your whole family down. So you need to do something bold. Take your family by the hand, be able to come to this altar and to ask their forgiveness and to say, I've been loving my neighbor and hating my enemies and pouring venom into our families. God, would you forgive me? And as a family, would you forgive me? Maybe it's time for your family to reset today and learn how to be able to love. If you're a person that just prayed with me a couple of seconds ago, and you ask Jesus to come in your life, can I ask you to do something super scary? You, you may not be a member here, you may have been here a long time. You may have just visited here for the first time, you may even be by yourself. But every Sunday, we just get time to be able to block off time. Our pastor stands here, other pastors will stand here. They'll just shake hands and pray with anybody who wants to pray. But if you just prayed with me to say, I wanted Jesus to come into my life, would you not walk out of here without letting us get a chance to be able to say congratulations? Let me help you understand next steps. It's no trick. We just want to be able to pray over you and encourage you. That's what we do. So if you just prayed and asked Jesus to come in your life or you have an interest in that, as soon as everybody stands and sings, why don't you come to the front and just shake hands with any one of these pastors at the front and just say, I need to know Jesus. And they'd love to tell you about how they came to Jesus and the difference that he's made in their life. Fair enough? It's simple but it's transformational because Jesus said, I, I know what culture says, love your neighbors, hate your enemies. That's not what I say. And that's actually what destroys a family and a life and a culture. Why don't we get back on the right track? Let's do that today. Let's stand, let's sing. You respond as God calls you to today. Oh
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. to know that at the end of any of my messages, I give you homework. You're welcome. Here's your homework assignment if you're willing to be able to take it up. No one's going to grade your paper. You don't have to put your name in the top right corner. You don't have to use the number two pencil. Your homework assignment is about you because this message and this reminder really is about not just what God does in culture, but what does, he does in our hearts. Because when we choose to love our neighbors and hate our enemies, it poisons our hearts, it poisons our families, it poisons our community. So can I ask you to do something really bold to your parents, to your children, to your spouse, to a friend that you know and trust. Would you today, maybe over lunch, just start a conversation and to say, this is a person or this is a group or this is a whatever it may be, I have a really hard time loving. And just open that conversation up. It's confession, quite frankly, to say, I'm following God here where I like to follow God and I'm not following God over here where I don't like to. But it's really the beginning of a dialogue among your family to say, what do we do about this? How do we hold each other to account? Because again, this is not about who's right and wrong. There are people that are wrong in practice and in moral behavior and whatever it may be. It's not about right and wrong about this. This is about, do I express the love of God to every person in every place as God does? Or do I choose to love some and hate others because that's easier and that's cultural. So your homework assignment is over lunch or sometime today, open up a dialogue with your family and to say, I have a hard time loving this group or this person, and I don't know what to do about it, or maybe you do. By the way, dads, you're the dad. Start this conversation with your family. 
lead it. Your family wants to see you actually step out and initiate this kind of spiritual conversation with your family. If you don't, as my mom always said, the Deborah principle will kick in and she'll just take over. And you should. Students, if your parents don't engage in this conversation, you lead it. And just begin by saying, I have a hard time loving this person because I guarantee you, if you're in middle school or high school, there are some people that are hard to love because they make it hard to be loved and hard to be able to engage with you. So just initiate that conversation and just start it open. You okay with that? Now I put you in a box. Welcome to your homework assignment. Family, it's good to be able to see you and to just bring a simple reminder of a truth that we all know. family, will you express your appreciation to Jane Blankley? Man, James, thank you for that word. It spoke to my heart. I just really, really appreciate the word you brought. You, you can be seated. In just a moment, we're going to be dismissed. And uh, I want to remind you out in our Archways area, if you are our guest today, we are so thankful that God brought you to this place. And we've got a gift that we'd love to give you, and we would love to meet you just personally. I'd love to be able to shake your hand and meet you personally. And so out in our Archways area at the welcome desk, uh, you can come and meet us there. And certainly, listen, I really believe some people here today prayed that prayer with James to receive Jesus as Savior. Don't leave this place today without telling someone. And so right after services are over, we'll be, here, be there at the welcome desk and the archways. Just come by and tell one of us, hey, I prayed that prayer or I need someone to pray with me about a need in your life. It, that's why we're there. We're there to minister to you and to pray for you. And so please come by and tell us that. There's a prayer card in the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out. Give us some information about yourself. If you're our guest, you can place that in one of the black boxes on the way out where we put our offerings each week. And, uh, or you can bring that right to us at the welcome desk. We'd love to meet you personally. We're going to pray together. I want to ask you to pray for James and Cindy. Uh, this afternoon, especially, they're going to be leading in a parent link uh, as part of our lunchtime uh, and after lunch. And, and God's just going to speak through that parent link today with James and Cindy Langford. But I'm so thankful uh, that Brother James was here with us today. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. We thank you for the way you are working and moving. Lord, help us to love you and to love others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will, take a look at our screens. Everyone had an incredible Easter holiday. I've got three quick things I want to share with you this morning. First, we have a ministry you may not know much about and they're doing incredible work. The Clinic on the Hill is a free clinic and over the last two years, they have served over 900 patients. This free clinic operates solely on the generosity of donors and exists to meet the health and heart needs of our community. Today, they are having an open house from 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. You're invited to visit the clinic and see firsthand the good work they're doing. Take your connect group or just swing by on your own. The entrance is on the west side of the building. Next Sunday, we kick off Revive, and we're so excited to see what the Lord has planned for that event. Over the course of four days, you'll hear from four dynamic speakers and see four incredibly talented musical acts. You don't need to buy tickets for any of the services or the lunch. Just show up. You don't want to miss this time of diving deeper into God's Word and drawing closer to Him. To learn more, visit qsbc.org slash revive. In two weeks on Sunday, April 21st, we will have Baptism Sunday. Across all three services, there will be opportunities to get baptized immediately. We'll provide everything you need, so if you make a last minute decision or forget something, we've got you covered. Even if you already know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but have not been baptized, don't wait. This is the perfect opportunity.
If you're a guest with us, we ask that you fill out the Connect card that's on the back of the seat in front of you and drop those off at one of the black boxes where we place our tithes and offerings. Also, Dr. Rummage would love to meet you. Right after the service, he'll be just outside the worship center by the information desk. And if you'd like to learn more or register for any upcoming events, all you have to do is scan the QR code on your bulletin. Have a blessed week. We are thankful to the Lord that all of you are here and worship with us today. But being here in worship is just part of what it looks like to be a part of the biblical community that happens here at Quell Springs Baptist Church. So if this is your first time or if this is your thousandth time and you are not plugged into a connect group, it's just a small group that meets on Sundays where we gather together with other believers and are challenged and encouraged by the word. And we have people to walk alongside and do life with. I encourage you today to check one of those out. You can go to the welcome desk to find out more information about that. So thanks for being at Quell Springs Baptist Baptist Church, where if you know what we do, would you say it with me? We gather together, build up, and send out. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed.